Something that is cool about that is that y'all get to see just how far you've come in two years. You know what I mean? That y'all have grown some. Um, but it is what it is. They needed this. They they needed it in order to graduate. Um, but when we take fertility and fertilizers, much different class, more hands-on, more practical application. This is just information. Is what this is. It's like animals. How many of y'all have taken animal science? How many of y'all are going to go into animal science? So you'll never need to know the scientific name of a sheep ever again. I have yet to use that, and I took it when I was. I took the 1,000 level animal science in Mississippi State, never used it. But in order to get a well-rounded education from a top tier university, they believe that you should know these things. Um, housekeeping. Um, Wednesday for lab, bring a laptop. We're gonna be doing some web soil survey stuff. Um, it goes a lot better when you can actually get in there and play with that yourself. So. Um, it would be beneficial if you brought a laptop to your lab. If you can't make lab, I'm going to post it online. And it's fairly straightforward. Some students just enjoy being there. They're the sick ones. Um, they actually enjoy being there and actually going through the process, being able to ask questions. But I mean, man, for the most part, this stuff is pretty straightforward. Most of us these days are very technologically advanced and can navigate websites and click on tabs and things like that. So. Um, not going to be anything if you can't make lab on Wednesday. But having a computer is going to benefit you greatly. Um, exam two should be pretty much upgraded. Everyone seemed to do okay with that. Super proud of y'all on that. Um, this module um, is going to be a lot of note cards and just a lot of memorization and being able to determine the difference in soil and subsurface horizons again just like Ovis Aries you will not likely use this information in your ag business career but you'll at least be able to talk with someone and understand kind of where we get this from um, so we'll start out with soil classification and we had these two guys in the well in the 1870s um, and then uh, C.F. Marbut in 1920s when they didn't have anything else to do, they didn't have cell phones and computers and all they, you know, it's kind of like some Lewis and Clark type stuff where they just went all around the country and um, tried to classify these different soil types because they started noticing these differences, that not all soil was the same. And um, so uh, Dukachev being a strong Russian name, um, what, during while I was doing uh, these slides, I learned that um, it's not just like the U.S. soil taxonomic classifications, that there are several different countries that have their own specific classification. But most of them do fall within kind of these same um, category, like we're, we're categorizing them the same way, much like our Munsell notation. Y'all remember when we did that in lab that we're able to determine colors and be able to kind of uh, think like someone else is seeing in their um, in front of them our soil series and classifications and suborders and orders and all these things are are gener generally uh, similar across taxonomic classifications there's like an Australian one there's an African one there's an American one there's a South American one uh, there's a European one, so kind of like your seven major continents, um, except for Antarctica, they don't really have soils, they just have ice. So uh, they follow similar patterns. And so we have uh, a pedon, which is going to be the smallest sampling unit uh, that we can see all of the properties of that particular soil. So a pedon kind of similarly being um, the soil sample that we took in the quad that seems like a month ago. I still had those soil samples. Turns out that Tennessee Tech is not doing soil sampling like I had boasted upon them on. And so I'm going to get those sent off today and not 100% sure I'll have those back by Wednesday. But we'll be doing the soil survey thing and we can look at some other things as well. Um, and then a polypedon is just going to be multiples of those. Um, and then finally our soil series is going to be the class of soil. 
So our soil textural classes, it is typically going to be a name of a town or an area or a region. Um, here on our far right, we see a pet on where we can look all the way through the soil profile. If we were to have like a, um, a two foot soil probe where we could extract all the way down to a depth of um, 48 inch or uh, 24 inches and pull that up, we would be able to see several of those different horizons. Um, and then within each one of those horizons, they have these little uh, characteristics of little, like subtypes um, that soil scientists can identify and understand what actually happened. Um, and so then we had that all the way across the landscape. And so while we did that on the quad, if we were to go out to Shipley Farm, the soils are much different there. Uh, they're not all consistent. And we even saw that in the quad, those soils weren't very consistent. We had the, the difference in the topography, whether it was kind of up the hill, ish, um, or kind of, you know, kind of in the lower ground. And so our soil series would be something like a Baxter Churdy Silt Loam. Yeah. The only people who would understand anything about a Baxter Churdy Silt Loam are probably people from Baxter. And some regional soil scientists in RCS that might have dealt with a Baxter Churdy Silt Loam. So soil taxonomic classification goes much just like plant taxonomic classification. We have these orders, um, a suborder, a great group, a subgroup, family, and series. But the way that we go about naming those or classifying them or writing them down, we would go from series to family to subgroup to group to great or suborder and then finally order. And so that's kind of what we are about to do. We're about to go from top to bottom. We're going to go, we're going to look at orders and suborders, great groups, subgroups that are kind of, you couldn't find much information about them. And then finally the family and series and we'll look at those as we move back up this pyramid. So there are 12 uh, soil orders. I think that while y'all are doing this, I'm going to try and hand out some papers. I'm going to do these alphabetically. And so to kind of understand, and there's like little key terminologies and little, little things that we can shorten, uh, this formative element, that whenever you see something that is a Haley Udall or a Hapley Udall or an, some out on the end of a term, on the end of a taxonomic classification, that's an indicator that that is an alpha salt. And so each soil order is going to have this formative element that we can just kind of shorten that gives the reader some indication of what soil order that is. And then within each one of those terminologies, there will be little key terms that we can pick out, the formative elements of our suborders, our great groups, our subgroups, our families, and our series. The thing about the alpha soils, is going to give it away is going to be a um, medium or high base saturation. Our andesols, which unless you work like kind of in um, the western United States or around volcanoes, you are not likely to encounter many of these. Um, this, there's probably about three or four soil orders that have like their own specialization. The rest of them we encounter fairly often, when septosols, entosols, oxisols, ultasols, um, alphasols, but andosols are, are, are kind of unique. And so they require uh, people studying those um, under different situations. Aridosols, 
Where do you think we're going to find these at? Which part of the country? Name a state you would think you would find in a rid Arizona. Arizona. Right. So our arid or semi-arid climate. There's not a lot of moisture. Um, they probably did not uh, have a lot of weathering. Because remember, the climate impacts our soil formation, one of those five soil forming factors. Um, and then we have these diagnostic surface and subsurface horizons, which we'll go over here in a couple of more slides. Uh, and so this is going to be kind of like a test question. Character, identify a soil that would probably have an argillic or a candic horizon with high to medium base saturation. Fill in the blank. Alpha salt, right? Forms in dry regions. Oh, eridosol. Entosols, E-N-T. And so these are our youngest soils. Uh, they have very little profile development. Um, I have a slide where it shows kind of the, 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 the maturity of soils. And entosols being the very first uh, the youngest soils. We have gel soils, and these are going to be. Uh, Canada, Iceland, Greenland, Northern Russia. There's not a lot of um, there's not a lot of time in between seasons. Those soils are typically frozen for more than two years. And so the way that those might form is from some frost churn. This would fall, the gelosols would fall into uh, the, kind of the same category as endosols, and those are very unique, and that it, there, there's not a whole lot to study there, because um, there's just not a lot of climate change that allows for weathering processes. The habitat uh, is probably not conducive for insects, unless it's a cold insect, uh, which they don't like that very much. Um, any type of plant growth that does happen and that leaf falls, like there's not enough, there aren't any insects that decompose that material, probably microbial uh, populations are low. So there's not a lot of development in those soils. Histosols are going to be kind of our peat or our bog. The indicating factor there would be greater than 20% organic matter. Um, and so we're thinking like South Louisiana, South Florida, somewhere where it's really moist and hot. Um, we have a lot of plant material that is decomposing. So we have high organic matter. Our insectosols are kind of uh, the, the second child or the youngest, the next to the youngest soils. And when I think about insectosols, I think about inception. Have any of y'all seen the movie Inception? Like the idea has to get planted and started. So this soil has already went through um, its endosol phase and has now started to develop a B horizon. Monosols are going to have a high base saturation and they're going to be our dark soils. And you will typically find these kind of in our Great Plains regions of the United States. That organic matter is being turned over very quickly. Um, 
it is decomposing. They're just ha it's it's just the perfect storm for uh, the right amount of rainfall, uh, the right amount of decomposition, the moisture, the temperature. Uh, there's enough such that that, uh, that, that that the decomposition rates are faster than in a peat bog, and then we get these very deep, dark soils that plant material has died. Uh, we also have a lot of cattle and um, wildlife roaming the Great Plains. Um, and so they're leaving some organic matter as they travel from Texas to Kansas City. Oxisols. These are going to be our highly weathered soils. These are likely to be the oldest soils. Uh, Georgia. Is from, I know, did I have one person from Georgia in here? Anyone? No one? That red dirt clay. When I think about oxisols, I immediately think aluminum and iron oxides. Everything else has been weathered away. Um, Brazil is going to have a lot of oxisols. It's in a region uh, that the rainfall, the temperature, the climate has caused the weathering to happen very quickly in all our bases. Uh, many other cations are leached out. These are also going to be um, remember when we watched the video and it said about the positive soils, there are soils that have positive charges um, or have a greater or more positive charges. Those are going to be, the oxisols will be the ones that have the pH dependent charge the other way. That when we uh, increase the acidity or decrease the pH, that we then get an anion exchange capacity because then we increase the attraction to anions. Spodosols, again, going to be in the same kind of classification with our gelosols and andosols. We don't encounter those very much, um, but we do have those aluminum and iron oxides and that humus accumulation, so we'll also have, um, it, not an issue, but we can expect to have um, our CEC be influenced by pH dependent charge because our resources of pH dependent charge are broken edges of clay, broken edges of clay, aluminum and iron oxide. Come on, come on, Jacob. What do you mean you're trying to think? What is humus? Functional groups of organic matter, which is what humus is, right? And I really thought y'all were going to kill that one. Altosols being the next oldest. So oxisols, altosols. And they have a low base saturation, whereas our oxisols don't have a base saturation because everything's been leached out, everything's been weathered. So our altosols, uh, they still have some bases in there. Um, apparently, we are in an, in a region um, that is predominated by uh, altosols. And then finally, our vertisols. And these are going to be our shrink swell clays. And when I think about vertisols, I think about vertical, such that those cracks form downward, not horizontal. Good on the slide. Anybody 
still need it? Nope. All right, so there are, I guess, over the next 12 slides, because we're about to kind of look at the 12 soil orders, uh, there are just a few extra things to write down that are going to help you determine the difference um, among these soil orders that also might be a part of that test question. It says uh, this alpha, 35% uh, greater base saturation with a natric subsurface horizon. Uh, and hopefully when I post these slides, you'll be able to look and kind of see. Uh, I really like these pictures up here that show uh, kind of where you will find some of these soil orders throughout our region. And so we see that some are right in there. We're right on the edge kind of uh, with a high concentration or propensity for alpha salts. Andesols, they're volcanic and they're young. You can see we were talking about time being one of those soil formation factors. So 10,000 years in soils is considered young. And because it's a young soil, it doesn't have any subsurface horizon, right? Because these are where we're gonna have um, a volcano that is going to expel some volcanic ash that is going to fall on the volcanic ash that it just expelled 700 years ago. And so those soils never really get an opportunity to form and undergo those weathering processes. Aritasols, as was mentioned earlier, those are gonna happen like in Arizona, um, out west, Nevada, we're going to go over the subsurface horizons, but primarily uh, pay attention to calcic, gypsic, salic, and natric. There's where our natrium comes in. Low moisture semi-arid arid regions. We've got West Texas, kind of bottom of South, I mean, um, South California, San Joaquin Valley. Entosols, no soil profile development. Our youngest soils. Gelosols, permafrost, freezing greater than two years, no surface horizon, no subsurface horizon development because of our climate. The temperature does not change enough to get some weathering process happening. It's just plastic. Pistosol. So I mentioned. And we're going to have those kind of in South Louisiana, South Florida. Apparently it looks as though there will be some up here in the Great Lakes region as well. Um, forming under anaerobic conditions, uh, typically where we would get our peat from. And I don't know as many of y'all know, but we get a lot of peat from Florida. Inceptosols, the inception of a D horizon. So we're starting to get some soil formation. You can see on the picture on the left um, where we're having these zones of eluviation and illuviation. We're getting some movement from this 
A, well, we have our O horizon right here, our organic, followed by our A, and then moving into a B horizon. These white deposits would indicate that there is some salt, which we can see from our subsurface horizons being calcic or gypsum. Oh. Mild salts would have greater than 50% base saturation, but we see again right in the mid plains in Nebraska, um, Oklahoma, South Dakota, North Dakota, kind of right up the middle of the United States. Oxisols completely weathered, completely leached. Our oldest soils. Oxisols, oldest. Photosols, acidic, sandy. We'll find those in South Florida. Looks like it's going to be uh, much of Maine is that is our photosols. And then again, where we had um, our peat bogs, our um, histosols. So remember we had histosols here, there. I think you can maybe, you know, Might be some right there. Um, but much in the same regions that we have our histosols, we can also have photosols. All the salts taking up much of the southeast region of the United States. Uh, I guess maybe I stand corrected that. The oxisols not being so much in Georgia, those rather being ultisols, uh, but still highly weathered uh, with a low base saturation. And so we have to fertilize these soils on a regular basis in order to continue to replenish the base. Someone also think about why else we would have acidic soils in that region. There's a couple of things and I just kind of want to see if y'all put some things together. What do we, what? Do we, we want pine trees? And pine trees like what type of soil? Acidic soils. Also think about industrialization. Population. So the more industry that we have, we're increasing um, some of those weather, the, the actual the chemical weathering of those soils. We add acids to them, uh, they break down some of those structures, uh, and we start to have quicker weathering patterns. It's also hot and humid, and it rains a lot. And so that climate goes into forming these soil waters. And then finally, our vertisols. High clay content, smectite, montmorillonite. Um, this is home for me. This is, this is Mississippi. Um, you can see there is a small reed, there's a small portion right there, this little crescent that is known as the Black Belt Prairie. That's kind of where Mississippi State is like, right on the cusp of that. So we have a big problem with foundations cracking. Our roads go like this. Uh, we have a lot of potholes and a lot of breaks that need to be fixed. And once you fix it, it's really broken and, it's easy, and it breaks easy again. So uh, this slide here is just, y'all don't have it on your, 
um, notes because there was no notes to take on. Uh, but just to kind of show you the timeline and the weathering um, and the age of these soils that we have entosols, uh, our histosols, gelosols, and andosols. They have not gone under very much weathering processes. Um, and I'll make sure that I post these online as well. Um, the, at least the student version. Like this is in the student version, I just didn't print it for you. And then moving along, we have altosols and spodosols. And then finally, oxosols have undergone the, um, the most weather. You won't need to know this stuff. This, this table right here is not like um, you need to memorize all of these formative elements for our suborders. If you were in soil classification or soil tax, uh, taxonomy, uh, if you wanted to go work for NRCS, you wanted to be a soil scientist, these are the types of things they spend their Friday night looking over. Not us, okay? We're trying to make money. We're trying to grow food and we're trying to feed the population. But to have an understanding of what these things are when you look at a soil and you get the taxonomic classification, you can look at it and go, I remember we did something with the mala. Let me go get my book out, my notes from Natural Soils class way back in the day, and look and see what, what was going on here. So there, there are some things that you might have to uh, come back and look at and go, where, what? here's this soil order. Here's this, when we go over web soil survey, you might be in charge of that land. And when you do, we're gonna go over and look and find out the soil taxonomic classification and how we can kind of pull some things out and get a better understanding of it. And kind of know a little bit about our soils. Um, but we do not have to memorize this. Um, there might be an exercise where we, you have this table and have to go identify some of those things, but that will be given to you. So just to kind of understand that these are where we're getting some of these uh, terms from. But our suborders, our suborders are going to be based on soil moisture regimes and also temperature regimes. So climate is what is going to affect our suborder. So anaerobic conditions, we have low oxygen, um, and you'll be able to see like a um, reduced soil, that gray, nasty, it's probably not gonna smell very good. Um, because it's been waterlogged and there's no oxygen, so all that stuff's been taken out, it is just nasty. Unit, high soil moisture and humid regions, probably kind of our region. I know definitely in Mississippi, I'll start getting into Georgia. Uh, but we'll probably have a little better drainage compared to an aquic suborder. Because if it's aquic, then we're probably going to have a high clay content because the water's staying there. So we have high water holding capacity um, and it's probably got a, a a layer that is impermeable that is stopping the water from draining out. So we may have got some infiltration, but we didn't get a lot of percolation. Eustick being somewhere in between those two, uh, probably uh, with a water table that is coming up from the bottom that is uh, saturating that soil, uh, but not as bad as uh, being saturated uh, compared to aqua. This would just kind of make sense. Arid dry greater than fit or dry for about half of the growing season. Moist less than 90 days. Mm -hmm. 
and then Zaire being some Mediterranean climate uh, with either warm and dry summers or cool and moist winters. That's how we would determine a Mediterranean climate. Just to understand the temperature regimes, again, not, not that you'll need to know this um, table, uh, but you might see um, a hypergelic soil. The gel kind of gives it away, doesn't it? You see how we have those little formative elements in there that kind of give you an inkling about what, what way or where this might be? Um, not so much in thermic, but when we think about a thermic reaction, we think hot, thermal. Looks like there are a whole bunch of great groups that some soil scientists and some soil classification taxonomic uh, major is going to have to remember, but we don't. But this is how they get those little pieces of information that make up this big long name. And all we know is that, hey, you need to go soil sample that and let me know what the soil test results come back as, and we need to fertilize that. But there are some diagnostic surface horizons um, that the, uh, like USDA, NRCS, they would know more about these and kind of, oh, well, that's a molly got the pet on. And, and they're in soil pits and um, they actually have competitions, they have soil judging competitions. Just like they have cattle judging competitions. Livestock judging competition? Yeah. No. I'm not that guy. I think they, they believe that I am and could, would, and should be, but I am not. I do not care. We're going to go plant something or we're going to grow it and then we're going to sell it. That's what I do. The difference between these two being the like the base saturation. So amolosol having greater than 50% base saturation and let's say maybe an alpha sol that only has about 35% base saturation. Or maybe something that has even less base saturation than that, like an oxisol or an ultasol. So that's going to kind of be your difference there. Like if you see that on the test question, thick dark color with low base saturation versus thick dark color with high base saturation. When I think about an okric epipedon, I'm thinking low organic matter. So it's going to have this light color. Low okric. Low organic matter. Low OM. All the O's. Be okric. You will probably only see like a melanic epipedon and a volcanic, melanic, volcanic. And you can just imagine that this is going to have high organic matter, or at least it's going to be organic of some sort, right? Because volcano ash is carbon ash. Histics, these are our, from our histosols. So they're going to have a very high organic matter content, like very high. In fact, <laughs> greater than 20% high organic matter. These are going to be from our peat bogs. So we can begin to think that if we have a histosol, that it is going to have a histic at the pet on. And then my, my boss really got me with this one. Um, not my current boss, my major professor from my, from my PhD got me with an anthrosol. And I was like, that's not a soil order. 
It's like, I would Google that if I were you. Although we don't talk about it very much, um, <laughs> and it probably won't make it into the Soul Science Society of America's dictionary as being an anthrosol, but when we think anthropic, we think anthropogenic, which means man-made. And so these are going to be um, like our overburden from a uh, mining situation of some sort. Um, something, that something that humans have modified and then put back as though we had it. Sweep that under the rug, pretend like we didn't destroy Mother Nature, and hopefully y'all will be okay with that. Right? So you might not run into that very much, but when you see anthropo, anthropogenic, anthropic, you can think humans. Man has modified that somehow. All right? I think that's all we're going to have for today. We will pick up here on Wednesday. Remember, a laptop is going to be beneficial for a lab. I'll make sure I post an announcement, send out an email. Um, we will see you all on Wednesday.